Our first reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, which can be found on page 592. We'll be reading from verses 1 to 9. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria and the farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says, sing with joy for Jacob, shout for the foremost of the nations, make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. The second reading is taken from Galatians chapter 3 on page 878. And we'll be reading from verse 26 to chapter 4, verse 7. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Silva. And um, hello, welcome once again. If you've slipped in since we began, it's so, so good to have you here. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to share a bit of what God has said to us in his word, the Bible. So shall we pray that God would help us as we look at this together? Our Father, thank you again for this morning, the celebration, the joy of being together, of seeing each other. And Lord, thank you for these words of life and words of hope. Please, would you Help us to listen and believe what you are saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, do keep that bit of Galatians open. We're sort of working through this bit of the Bible week by week, and there's a little outline on your sheets if you'd like to follow along, if that'll keep you uh, entertained. When are you going to hug me? When are you going to hug me? Do you remember Elton saying that if you've seen the film Rocket Man? He said it to his dad. It's the story of Elton John growing up and very, very tragic story. And one of the most poignant things about it is his relationship with his dad. When are you going to hug me? And his dad replies, don't be soft. But if you've seen the film, I'm sure, like me, you are deeply moved by that tragic relationship. I'm aware there's been some pushback about the accuracy of how it's portrayed, but Elton himself did actually say that it was the raw truth. In any case, it's a profoundly powerful picture, isn't it, of what's all too common. 
a heartbreaking, life-crushing lack of affection from a father or a parent towards their kids. Now, I'm aware as I talk about this that I'm treading on thin ice because it's an incredibly emotive area, isn't it? And I'm very privileged to have grown up in a home where I've, I've always known love and known that I am loved, but many haven't. And if we haven't had that, then I guess that the longing must be even deeper to know love, to know true, generous, kind love. And you see, today, as you would have noticed in those readings, we're thinking about God as our Father. And the Bible says that it's really, really good news that we can know God as our loving Father. I don't know how that makes you feel. Uh, maybe you've heard that sort of idea before. Maybe it's completely weird, doesn't make sense. But we need to always resist the temptation to kind of import into that idea our own experiences of fathers, mothers. Rather, God shows us what a perfectly good, kind father is. Now, if pressed, I wonder how you would answer this question. What would you say God is in one word? I don't know what first comes to mind. Maybe creator, judge, ruler, they're all true, aren't they? But most centrally in the Bible, God is actually father. Just hear me out on this one, because there's, there's been a time of creation, okay? The Bible starts in the beginning, God created. And so before that, God eternally existed as father, son, spirit. He's always been father, son, and spirit. There was a time where he created, but we can't then say that he's most fundamentally creator, because for most of eternity, he hadn't yet created. Likewise, there was a time when he began relating to the world he made. And so, again, we can't really say most fundamentally God is ruler or judge. He hadn't yet created. <laughs> now, he is those things. But you see, most fundamentally, at the very heart of who God is, he is Father, Son, Spirit. He's always been Father, Son, Spirit. Now, what's going on here? Why have we suddenly gone into all of this quite deep stuff? Well, this is the background to what Paul is saying here. This is the language Paul is using, God as a father. And we need to keep hold of that because we're in the middle of this letter. Okay, We've just dived in today, haven't we? Partway through, we've been seeing the last few weeks this state of emergency in a place called Galatia. Paul is writing to them saying, don't turn away from God. Don't give up on what you've heard. It's true. Believe it. God has shown you grace and peace in Jesus. That's the only hope. It's the only good news. And now today, Paul's unpacking the chief blessing of that gospel. The best thing, the best thing about being a Christian. And it's this, that we can know God the Father as our Father. Did you see that in verse 26? This is the greatest thing. Look down with me again at Galatians 3, verse 26, at the bottom of page 878. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So I'd love us to explore three kind of implications of that this morning, okay? First is this, that it means we can be united in Christ, united in Christ by a new identity. Verse 26 again, in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We've seen the last few weeks the difference between do and done. How almost all religious approaches and views in the world are about do. This is what we do for God. Do this, do that. And then maybe you'll sort of make your way up to him. But no, the wonderful difference about the Christian faith is it's a message of done. Here's what God has done in Jesus. And we receive that. We receive that forgiveness, that salvation, simply through faith. Faith means relying, relying on him alone, not on what we do. And the result, verse 26, children of God. Children of God through faith. And there's a sign, there's a sign of that to kind of demonstrate it to us and to others. And verse 27, baptism for all of you who were baptized 
into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. No coincidence, we plan our diary very carefully here at CCV. <laughs> Baptized into Christ, it's a sign of belonging to God through faith. It's a symbol, he says here, of putting on Christ. It's such a powerful symbol. It means so many things. As we heard earlier, it's like passing through the Red Sea. Another image is like clothing. It says you've put on Christ. It looks like we all put on clothes this morning. Just checking. Yeah. We, we put things on, don't we? And they, they cover us. And they kind of present us in a certain way. My daughter's decided to wear sunglasses this morning. It's her new look, apparently. <laughs> we all put on clothes, and um, you would have noticed Bethia and Grace looking particularly special and smart, representing a special event. And you, know, you might know the tradition of a baptism gown, kind of a white flowing dress that is a picture of being washed clean. Washed clean by Jesus. That's what he does by dying in our place. And so now we're, we're clothed in him. We're presented to God Spotless, perfect, because of Jesus, wrapped up in him. And so do you see, Christ now defines us. If we put our faith in him, he is what defines us. And because he defines us supremely, that unites us. Christ defines us and unites us, and therefore nothing else. He mentions race, uh, social standing, gender, a Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. No, those things might be kind of true of us. They may mark us, but they don't define us. This would have been a bombshell, <laughs> a complete bombshell. If you know anything, if you've read horrible histories or even, you know, Roman society was incredibly hierarchical. This was written in the first century. This would have been an absolute bombshell. The big issue for this particular church, as we've seen, was they were wondering, well, do I need to become Jewish? You say, no. All ethnicities, all cultures can be one through faith in Christ. Likewise, your social status. In those days, every slave would have looked at a free person with you know, terrible envy and wondered, why has this happened to me? But every free person would have looked at a slave with, I guess, either pity or scorn. But no, we're completely leveled. Christ defines us. Christ unites us. A male, female. Our society is so confused on this and it's saying all sorts of weird and conflicting messages on gender. Is it a big thing or does it not really matter? We're so confused as a society, aren't we? And the Bible is just so liberating and so helpful. Yes, we are gendered, made by God, male and female, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't define us. We don't need to feel constrained or defined by any culture's view of what male and female is. It's not your ultimate identity. Christ defines us and unites us as his people. You see, before we come to know God in Christ, this is certainly true of me, I don't know about you, we kind of scramble around, don't we, desperately trying to secure our identity in something or someone. I remember as a teenager, I was so confused, you know, am I in with the cool kids? Probably not. <laughs> am I in with the rugby guys? Well, I'm not really good enough. Am I in with the musos? Well, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, who am I? And that's not just a teenage thing, is it? It, it runs through life. Who are we? We're desperately trying to find an identity. And wonderfully, God, our creator, gives us a new liberating identity, the identity we were made for, to know him as our father through faith in Christ. And so now whatever your background, whatever your skin color, gay, straight, macho, camp, big, small, introvert, extrovert, those things don't define us. Christ defines us and unites us. It's one of the many things I love about church. You might be quite new to coming along to church, I don't know. It's so special, so rare and unique to belong to a family. We are a family, a community, where we are united by this new identity that God has given us. And another precious thing about the church is that that includes our children. They too are brought into this wonderful unity that Christ creates. Little Bethia and Grace, they, they can't articulate their faith yet, can they? But all in Christ, verse 29, are heirs according to the promise. That's always been God's way, Old Testament, New Testament. 
His promises are for us and our children. There's no more secure or liberating identity than clothed in Christ. So he unites us with a new identity. But also, second, it means we are a hopeful people. We're hopeful in Christ because of our new inheritance. Did you notice all that language about heirs and inheriting and that sort of stuff? Would you read again with me from verse 29? It's at the very end of chapter 3 there, top of 879. It says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Now, this sounds a bit foreign and alien because culture's changed a lot since then, but go back in time to first century Roman culture. Imagine like a beautiful Italian estate, okay, like this. I don't know if you've seen one on holiday. Um, on my honeymoon, we would go and pass places like this. Um, imagine this, a kind of wealthy family on a grand estate. And think of the little son of the family kind of kicking around, chasing chickens, plucking grapes off the vines, I don't know. And he's the heir of this grand estate. So there's a sense in which he kind of owns it, but he's not in possession of it yet. In fact, in those days, you'd be under a kind of guardian like we saw last week, a kind of tutor figure who, a bit like a nanny, sort of brings you up. They'll still have influence over you until kind of your late teens, early 20s, actually, in that culture. And we saw last week, didn't we, that God's people, Israel, in the Old Testament before Jesus, they were kind of under the tutorship, that picture, under a guardian of the law, the law of Moses given in the Old Testament. It was good, but it couldn't really give them life. It couldn't give them freedom. In fact, it only shows how desperately we need forgiveness. But now Christ has put an end to all of that. God's people are of age now, if you like. This is what Christ's coming does. It changes everything. They're free in Christ now. The one who took the curse for them, who who paid for all of our sin, all of their sin. And that's why Paul is writing this letter. They mustn't go back to the law. It's not about law keeping anymore. It's about the love of God and responding in love to him. But this wasn't just an issue for them then, if it all sounds a bit distant. No, verse 3, it's about us as well. He says, so also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, the point is, whatever our religious or cultural backgrounds, all of us, by nature, are slaves. We're all enslaved in our hearts to different kind of forces or ideas or principles out there in the world. That sounds a bit strange, but think about it. Think of our desires and how powerful they are, or our ambitions, or pressures that we feel on us. Don't they have a phenomenal grip on us? The job, maybe, that that always encroaches on our family or our personal well-being. The desires for intimacy or security or affirmation that no relationship ever satisfies. There's a sense in which we're all slaves to these things. But here's the good news, verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Born to redeem us, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, verse 6, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God's made you also an heir. God sent his precious son, Jesus, the eternal son, remember, Father, Son, Spirit, forever, And then the son enters history and humanity and lives the perfect life under the law, perfectly good. Those closest to him could say he never lied, he never sinned. Who can say that? Only Jesus. Perfect life, which he then gave for us. The greatest exchange. He's sacrificed to redeem us, to buy us back from slavery. 
But he doesn't stop there. It's more than that, isn't it? It's not just he buys us back from slavery. Then we're adopted into the family. Adopted into the family. He shares his sonship with us. Staggering. We're brought into Christ. We had an image a few weeks ago of like a a baby in the womb. It's like we're so intimately connected to him. All our life comes from him. Wherever the mother goes, we go. That's what it's like being brought into Christ. We're all in him, all clothed in him. We become sons or heirs in Christ. Most glorious exchange. The eternal son of God became human so that we humans could become sons of God. The good law maker and perfect law keeper gave his life for law breakers like me and you. He paid for our debt. We receive his inheritance. Now, you may or may not think much about inheritance. I don't know your financial situation or your family situation. Um, but did you hear about Nina Wang? This is quite a famous story a few years back. Nina Wang's estate. Uh, she was an eccentric Hong Kong billionaire who died in 2007 which was once known as Asia's wealthiest woman. And then there's this guy, Tony Chan, who's a feng shui master. And he claimed that she had changed her will so that he was due to inherit all of her billions of wealth. Well, he was after her $12 billion estate. <laughs> uh, the courts weren't going to just let that go easily. And sadly for him, in 2013, he was sentenced to 12 years for forgery. <laughs> So, sorry, mate, better luck next time. <laughs> but um, I doubt many of us are in his kind of position, inheriting anything like that. Um, but maybe we'll inherit something, I don't know. But think not just about financial inheritance. What is it, deep down, that you're really hoping for? What are you really living for, longing for? Is it the perfect family? the perfect partner, the perfect house. Well, do you realize that if you put your faith in Christ, we are loaded. <laughs> We're completely loaded in him. That Italian estate looks like a Lego house compared to our inheritance. To be an heir of God means we're on our way to entering and inheriting God's glory, entering his perfect new creation, free from all decay, disease, and death, free from all sin and suffering and sorrow. Now, is it just castles in the sky, <laughs> wishful thinking? No. This is because of the historical, verifiable life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so as children of God, we are hopeful people. We live for the future, for our inheritance. Whatever trials or tragedies come our way, we have the certain hope of inheriting God's glory. Christ gives us hope like nothing else. And today, Bethia and Grace enter and join that hope-filled people. Hopeful in Christ. And lastly, another glorious, wonderful truth from these verses about our knowing God as our Father. This is what we can have through Christ's security. We can become secure in Christ with a new privilege. Let me read verse 5 again. It says, Christ redeemed those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, I don't know everyone here. Some of us may have been adopted as children. Some of us have adopted children. And it is a stunningly beautiful thing to do. Supremely because it is a thoroughly godlike thing to do. A friend of mine has an adopted seven-year-old son. And um, it's not been straightforward. It's been incredibly hard and difficult and exhausting. Sadly, there's a lot of trauma in, in the background. And uh, that's been incredibly difficult for the boy, obviously. And 
his new mum and dad, my friends, he tells me about these extreme challenges, how he won't sleep at night for years because of trauma. But with gushing love, my friend says, I wouldn't change it for the world. What an image to use of God's love for us. He's adopted us. He knows all our mess. He knows what he's taking on. He wouldn't change it for the world. So we tend to think, don't we, if you're anything like me, at times we think, God must, God must really hate me. <laughs> he must really despise all of this mess inside me. Do you ever feel like that? It's wrong. <laughs> wrong. God wants you. God wants to adopt you. He sent his son to redeem you, to buy you back from slavery. He sent his spirit to live in your heart, the spirit of God himself, to give you a personal experience of God's love. I wouldn't change it for the world, he says. I stumbled upon a story this week um, of an 11-year-old girl, Embla Ademi. Did you hear about this? She has been bullied at school in um, North Macedonia. And she was cast out from her class, not only by her friends, but by their parents as well. Why? Because of her Down syndrome. Well, when the president, Stevo Penderovsky, heard of this, the president of North Macedonia, he went to meet the family, <laughs> sat with her, chatted, gave her crayons, and walked Embla to school hand in hand. Can you just imagine how that walk to school would have felt? <laughs> Think of all the dejection she's felt before, all the hurts, being cast out. Now she walks to school honoured, dignified, secure. Friends, God adopts us through Christ. He gives us a dignity, an honour, a security that means we can Stand up tall. We're going to hold our heads up high. Not because of anything in us. We're completely undeserving. But because of him. We're so secure in the love of God. We keep saying this every week because it keeps coming in this letter, Galatians. It's throughout the Bible. It's so important. Christianity is not about what we do for God. It's about what God does for him. For what God does for us. Uh, this, again, is why baptism is such a powerful picture, such a powerful picture of the gospel, of this good news for us to enjoy, because it's not about Bethia's faith or Grace's faith, ultimately. It's about God's grace, God's kindness to us. So we pray they'll grow up always enjoying that in the family of faith. It's the best news in the world. It really is. God loves us because of his grace. It's a free gift. This is love that defines love. And so now we can call out, verse 6, Abba, Father. We can call out to him as our dad. Call out to him. That's what his spirit does in us. Now get this, one more thing about adoption. Okay? Adoption in Paul's day was quite different, actually, from in our day. It would only happen then if a father had no heir, no one to inherit the, the estate, if you like. And so he would specially choose a young man to come and be the heir. And that's kind of how it worked. So do you see what this image means? Because God, God the Father, remember, has always had God the Son. <laughs> He's always had an, an heir. The Bible says that the whole universe belongs to Christ. And so this is what's happening when God adopts us. He, he brings us into Christ and we become sons in the Son. <laughs> That's what we receive. We receive the very same inheritance as Jesus, as God the Son. That's why he says in these verses, because you are his sons, verse 6. That's not leaving the girls out. No, guys and girls equally become sons in the Son, heirs of this glorious inheritance. Staggering that we are kind of almost on a par with Jesus. I hardly dare say that, but that's what he's saying. We, we become co-heirs with Christ. And so just as Jesus prayed to God and said, Abba, Father, the everyday Aramaic word for dad, that becomes our relationship to God. 
Staggering. We read that passage in Jeremiah, didn't we? That throughout the Old Testament, God's people kind of collectively were called his son. He became a father to them. And now that becomes us in the son, in Jesus. So as we close, let me just give you four things to take away with you this morning. I wonder which of these most speaks to you. Because of this, because in Christ Jesus, we can become sons of God. It means God wants you. God wants you. He chose to adopt messed up sinners like me and you. He wants you. Maybe you've been running from him for some time now. I don't know. His arms are wide open. God wants you and God secures you. When we come to God in Christ, we are as secure as Jesus. God the Father is never going to disown God the Son. We become as secure as him. God secures you and God dignifies you. We're not just forgiven slaves. We are redeemed. We have been slaves to sin. Yes, we are forgiven, but we're not just forgiven slaves. No, we are adopted sons, loved sons. So we don't have to mope around kind of guiltily. Oh, woe is me. I'm, I'm such a wretch. I'm so unworthy. We're not just forgiven slaves. We're adopted sons. God dignifies you. And lastly, God welcomes you. God welcomes you. Isn't verse 6 just amazing? Let's read it one last time. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. It's the highlight of my day when I get home and Clemmy, our two-year-old, toddles up towards the door. Daddy! Fills my heart with joy. That is how God feels. When we cry out to him, Abba, Father, he welcomes you. He welcomes you. Prayer. Prayer isn't a chore or a duty. It's a privilege. It's the result of the gospel. So God wants you. God secures you. God dignifies you. God welcomes you. This is what you can have in Christ. And whether we've known that for years or whether it's quite new to us, let me pray that God would help us to believe this and receive this. Let's pray together. Our Father God, thank you so much for sending your Son, for sending your Spirit. Thank you that you have done everything to mean that we can know you as our Father, the perfect, loving Father forever. Please would you be at work in us by your spirit to help us to believe this and to receive this and enjoy this for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.